United Masters is changing the game for independent artists. With our iOS and Android app, you have an entire record label in your pocket. You can distribute tracks right from your text messages, and once your music is released, you'll know exactly who your fans are. The payment function makes sure you get paid on time. But the best part, from now on, you can choose. You can go with our 90-10 royalty split for no upfront cost, or you can go with our new option, United Masters Select. Keep 100% of your streaming royalties for $5 a month, no hidden fees. As a select artist, you can release as many songs as you want to all major streaming platforms. Get your tracks live quickly with Express Distribution and partner with the world's biggest brands. Your songs will reach millions through opportunities with ESPN, Twitch, and the NBA, just to name a few. Select artists can also get featured on Baseline, Apple's biggest playlist for independent artists. United Masters, a record label in your pocket. Hey, look, I pray you catch a way That doesn't subside This for the nappy heads in heaven With the nappy head Christ by their side I pray you catch a way So while the opportunity uh, to, to work with Apple and the NBA Of course, through United Masters and uh, Steve Stout was uh, amazing I think uh the even more amazing opportunity was to be able to do this uh, with my family, not just my family, with my people. So I'm talking about Jeff, I'm talking about uh, Justin, the Black Angels. It was our first time ever uh, being on the PJ. I don't say that lightly. So I got the, my, my first time, I got to experience it with my people, which was beautiful. Okay, all right. Uh, well, you know, I first want to welcome everybody uh, to the UN Lab webinar, Creating a Major Rollout as an Independent Artist Inspired by Travis Scott. Uh, my name is Ogden Payne, and we have uh, David Melhado, the head of marketing at United Masters. David, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. Yeah, man, I'm really excited. Um, we've been doing these UM Lab sessions. Uh, we started at the height of the pandemic, and uh, they serve to be a great way for us to be able to help our artists in our platform uh, get involved and uh, learn as much as they can and educate themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I'm really excited because, you know, tonight we're really going to be diving deep into kind of the, the nuances of, you know, Travis Scott's, you know, franchise rollout. Uh, you know, obviously, independent artists don't have the, the same budget or, you know, necessarily the same resources, but what we're gonna be doing is really breaking down Travis's approach and get kind of an understanding on how independent artists can have a similar impact and effect um, on a much smaller budget, right? And so I think um, at least the way that I'm kind of seeing this go is the end goal is really kind of creating some, some tangible tools, um, resources and ideas for you know the independent artists uh, next rollout. So uh, if you're ready, I'm ready to, to kind of jump into it. Yeah, no, nah, for sure. And I think that, you know, I think a lot of times I hear artists say, but I don't have a budget, right? And I think that, uh, you know, as an independent artist, you have a, a great opportunity to be resourceful. And hopefully through the tips and the breakdown of Travis Scott's project, we can then show you how you can create a rollout similar, but you can be resourceful to do so. And you can go a long way with it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. So great. So I think, um, you know, to kick everything off, let's kind of start at the, the very beginning, right. Of, of Travis's, um, okay. rollout with franchise. So let's kind of start with the song, um, and the album artwork. Uh, you know, obviously this was created by George Kondo, incredibly, uh, you know, famous and, and acclaimed artist. um, you know, kind of in your opinion, what do you think working with an artist kind of at this caliber or at this scale, did to kind of build the hype around, you know, Travis's rollout. Yeah, and I think that it's, uh, you know, I think this is, it really stood out because Travis now created a way for his album artwork or his single artwork to be a promotional tool, right? He took a collaboration with someone that was gonna expose him to a whole new audience and that's what George did, right? So he paired up with a visual artist that has a, a whole nother world, a whole new audience of fans and people who engage with their artwork. So now when you pair Travis with, with George, 
it now brings you into a whole nother world and creates a whole new audience for you to be able to engage with. Travis does, across the board, Travis does a great job of doing this, right? And we've seen it time and time again. He's doing things in gaming with Fortnite, so it brings him to the gaming community. He does it with McDonald's, so now the mainstream uh, community is looking at him as uh, a name, right? People are going crazy over the, the, the McDonald's t-shirt <laughs> merch, right? Uh, and then he does it with Nike and Jordan, right? So uh, these are examples of ways that he uh, finds way to reinvent himself and then bring and merge worlds together. Right, right, absolutely. So, you know, it's interesting because when, before franchise was kind of known as franchise, I think it was leaked as white tea, right? And, and I think there was kind of like a, a snippet um you know that kind of leaked before the the official rollout so i mean it i guess in your opinion like how do you think or, or how might previewing a song um with one name and then changing it kind of maybe at the last minute invigorate travis's fan base you know kind of more than usual yeah it created a lot of confusion even after like while we was talking about and preparing for this webinar when you said let's talk about franchise i started thinking like yo what song is that right because i knew the song is white tea and before I started to kind of do deep dive, it just created confusion, right? But what, what does it do? It creates a moment for your fans now to be talking about it, right? And ultimately it just became another moment for Travis to control attention for Twitterverse and Instagram and fans alike to start talking about it, right? And that's what you wanna be able to do when you're, you're about to roll out a project. You wanna create excitement and you wanna control attention. Right, right. Okay, so so then kind of moving a little bit um, along after, you know, franchises is, is already rolled out. Um, I think like the next week, there's there's like a, a remix that drops, obviously, with Future, right? So I, I kind of want to get your opinion. What do you think pre Future's presence kind of added to the life of the song? I think there's a lot of artists who, you know, obviously do remixes and to try to extend the life of, of a song. But I, I would love to know kind of your opinion as far as in Travis's case bringing future on to you know this song in particular kind of what you think that that did to extend the life i think that travis was he did a couple things with, with bringing future on the remix and you know i think traditionally in music like we always see remixes as something that come after the height of the success of the record right but by him releasing it two weeks later he recognized that his fans uh have shorter attention span right and he wanted to create another moment to create excitement right and uh, that's what it's about when you're creating your rollout. You want to be able to create multiple tempo moments, like moments that people are going to consistently be talking about it. But he aligned with another popular artist that also had a large following, right? So again, now Travis was going into another world or even just another, if he can chip off a, a fraction of the fans that, that Future has, now he's able to tap into Future's algorithm, right? right. So when we right. look at Spotify and we look at, uh, Travis's profile, and we look at Future's profile, the song is, ends up on both of the profiles. And and now that creates another moment for Travis to be able to tap into a whole new audience. And he uses like promotion as as the vehicle to do so. Right, right. Okay, cool. So so we kind of have this, this foundation, right? Of, okay, this is what kind of Travis did around just the song in general, right? From the album artwork to, you know, the, the song itself, the remix, changing the name moving forward um digital right and, and what travis was kind of able to do uh digitally starting with his website um you know travis really used this to hold important information about not only the song but i think the release date as well uh you know what do you think i guess kind of the the importance or or the end goal was of putting this type of important information solely on a website because i don't think originally when the song was announced that there was um, a release date. I think you had to go to the website to find it. Yeah. And, and I think that, uh, you know, when you're preparing your rollout, uh, Travis did a great job of doing this, where he basically directed his fans where he wanted them to go, right? He took you off of the social platforms. He took you off the blogs. He took you off of YouTube, took you off the streaming platforms and said, go to this destination, right? And that gave him an opportunity to be able to control and uh, control the, the content that he was feeding you. So when you went to his website, you now saw that it was attached to a release date. Now it's creating a whole nother level of excitement. And because he did that, it was like surprise and delight. Now fans are checking back and forth to your website. It gives you an opportunity to now capture data, right? 
because ultimately he's he's collecting your emails. He's now able to communicate a message and now he's taking you away from those social media platforms. And now he's showing that I can tell my fans to go anywhere and they're going to come to that space to consume my content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, okay. So then kind of moving forward, right. I guess as far as uh, the, the visual elements that, that mm -hmm. Travis was able to kind of create, I think there was uh, a music video. I think there was kind of a behind the scenes, a visualizer and a lyric video. Um, I think, can you quickly just like describe each one of these visual elements, maybe for, for some of those who maybe aren't necessarily familiar with maybe like what a visualizer is or a lyric video. Um, and then also just kind of an understanding of why Travis may have chosen these four to, to run with. Yeah. So when you're putting your, your content pieces together, you want to be like, like his in general was like really conceptualized. Right. And it was real strategic the way he rolled them out. Uh, so when you think about the elements of the content, the long form content he created, he had uh, a music video, he had visualizers, he had a lyric video, um, and then he also did behind the scenes. And what each one of these things do, it gives you another moment for your fans to engage with you, right? So everyone knows what the music video does, right? It gives you that visual, it's the full length of the song, right? Now, a lot of times when you're listening to music, you're listening to it passively, right? And if you're listening on YouTube, you don't have to have a subscription you can literally listen to his whole album, but you don't necessarily have to be watching it. So these visualizers are another way that you can engage, and it's another way that fans can consume your music, right? And it could be anything from an animation. Uh, I remember like on Windows, um, Window music, Windows uh, Media Player, right? Yeah. Back in the day, your visualizer was like the screen and had all these different, and Twitch, you can find that on Twitch also, right? Um, so it's just another way to engage the fans and the audience. Um, the third is the lyric video. Everybody wants to know what people are, what he's saying in his music, right? So you create a lyric video so people can engage with the song, but also learn the, the record as well. And then the emotional connection piece that he created with the behind the scenes. He's now showing you behind the scenes of the making of his content and how he's moving it through his day. Right. And that's another way for fans to get further engulfed in your life and in your career. Yeah. And so I, I think also what's really interesting, too, right, is he, he takes these these visual elements and then he kind of repurposes each one for his social media platforms. And so yeah. I guess kind of in your 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 thought process, your understanding, what was kind of the importance behind repurposing, you know, kind of all of these different types of uh visual elements on, on his social media platforms. Cause you couldn't find everything on every platform. You kind of had to dig a little bit, you know, maybe one thing was on Twitter, maybe one thing was on Instagram. So I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts as far as maybe, um, you know, what, what his thought process was or, or what the, what the best strategy was for that. Yeah. So you always want to be able to try to, uh, to continuously drive awareness and attraction to your project. Right. And creating on social, you want to be able to create cut downs. You want to be able to, to show pieces of content that you hadn't shown before. And he did a really good job of, of uh, cutting down the content in, in creative ways and then rolling it out across his different social platforms. So that way you can see different elements of the rollout campaign. So you always wanna be able to, uh, you know, repackage and recreate the content that you have so that way it feels new. Right, right, yeah, no, 100%. And so, um, you know, as far as the we so we OK, we check off the song, we check off digital moving into brand. Right. Moving into how Travis was really able to, I guess, kind of make himself feel a little bit larger than life with, you know, all the partnerships. I kind of want to break down, um, you know, a few things. Right. Starting with Ray, uh, Wave Radio, which is, you know, his, his radio show on Apple Music. Um, I think he, he debuted franchise on his radio show and i'm curious or, or he pre previewed it i think i don't think he debuted it um but what do you think previewing the song on on wave radio apple music did for building hype i mean that's his platform you know that's where fans really kind of gravitate to listen to what he's listening to what do you think that kind of did to invigorate his fan base yeah so it's it's another moment where you're trying to uh drive your fans to a space where they're going to consume your content in a different way right so if, if he has this platform, Wave Radio, right, he wants to drive listenership. So a way that he can promote listenership of Wave Radio is saying, come over here so that way you can engage with my content, right? And, and with hopes that you're always going to come back for it, right, or listen in. 
So he did a great jo job of doing that. And I think that we'll show, we'll jump into ways that you can do it as an independent artist in a, in a few, but you're always trying to find ways that you can tease and engage your audience and, and ultimately get them excited, right? Um, so that way they uh, are looking forward to your release. Yeah, absolutely. So, so then, you know, kind of transitioning into the, the obviously the big McDonald's partnership, I think that made incredible waves, um, you know, over the, the, the past couple of months. Um, you know, how did how did someone like Travis make sure that his moment of releasing his single wasn't overshadowed by the brand power of somebody like a McDonald's? Right. Like, how was he able to kind of still hold his own um, up next to a McDonald's versus, you know, McDonald's brand kind of overshadowing uh, what he was trying to do? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this goes for for any artist. Right. You got to consistently build your platform up. Right. So that way. Uh, over time, you're prepared for these big tipping point moments, right? So you want to be able to do the little things. And Travis, over time, he created tons of content. He created these rabid, like, moments where fans just gravitated towards his content, right? Fortnite happened, where it created another, like, cultural moment where people talked about him. The dunks, like the Nike dunks, right? So he consistently, over time, was building his, his base, where people he's grown this this constant excitement. So when McDonald's hit, he was already at a point where he's building the momentum, right? And as an independent artist, you got to do the same thing, right? And we'll kind of talk through a couple of those moments as well and show you how that kind of how you can apply that same kind of thinking to your campaign as well. Right, right. Uh, and you know, kind of the one of the final things that I kind of want to um, wrap Travis's rollout under uh, IMAX. Right. Um, you know, what do you think that the partnership with IMAX, what do you, I guess, kind of believe the purpose was of this and like, how did it impact the fan experience uh, yeah. with franchise? Yeah. So like one of the, the most important things for me when I'm always seeing with artists, I'm always really trying to drill down to them. Like, how are you going to create an emotional connection with your fan? Right. After they listen to your song, after they finish watching your, your show, like, what are they going to talk about, right? What are those little, like, almost like artifacts that they're going to take home and and cherish and remember, right? And the IMAX experience is that, right? He created an immersive experience where he was going to consume and watch his his video and enjoy it, but it was going to be a, a talking point, right? And you're always trying to find, as an, as an artist, as a manager, um, when you're building your campaign, you're always trying to find these moments where you can create the emotional connection with your fan. And I think that that's key. A lot of people look past that, right? They're thinking about they're making the music for themselves or uh, they're not thinking about how they're engaging or how the fans are uh, receiving the content or the music, but he's very much in tune into his audience and he's able to now create experiences for your artists around that. The album before that, he created, what was it? The, uh, uh, the world, right? It was like a, a theme park, yeah, right? Absolutely. He's always creating these immersive experiences so that way you can go home and you can talk about it forever. And it's a moment that you remember. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, great. This this was this was perfect. So I think, you know, I think we did a really great job of um, taking a look at, at Travis's rollout for franchise, right? So I think kind of now moving forward, um, let's kind of talk, let's let's really kind of ideate how can independent artists take these ideas, these concepts, and interweave them into their next rollout. Again, yeah. not every artist has, uh, a lot of artists don't have the Travis Scott budget or resources, but, you know, I think this this part is going to be something where we can really kind of analyze, break down, and, and figure out how can an independent artist get kind of the same effect, right? So, yeah, uh, like I, I saw, yeah. saw, I think it was Joe, he said, uh, yeah, this is an established artist, but we wanted to show you what Travis Scott did, because I think a lot of times, there's a lot of gems and jewels that you can take from established artists that you can then apply to your own career and do it in your own way. So that's what we're about to show you how to to take uh, some of the strategy things. Right. We broke down the strategy, like the, the three main elements that he had in his campaign from the song rollout to the digital rollout and to the how he integrated brands. So we're going to show you how you can do the same thing as an independent artist for a fraction of the cost. Yeah, 100 percent. So let's 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 start there. Right. Um, going back to the song, album cover, album artwork, uh, you know, how should artists really be thinking about using cover art to further their promotion? 
versus it versus it just being an, an artistic asset. You know, how can you really use your your cover art as a promotional tool, kind of in the same vein that Travis did? Yeah, I, I mean, ultimately, that's the first piece of the cover art is usually the first piece of uh, content that someone sees from you uh, as for your release, right? So if you think about it as your storefront, um, and it's the thing that people are going to remember, right? So I've actually done this a few times. I had an artist that was from Philadelphia, right? And he was heavily into art, visual arts as well. So we went to an artist named Gianna Lee, who is a, a well-known street artist in New York, but he's also from Philadelphia. So in the EP, we rolled out three singles and we had Gianni Lee create the artwork for all those three singles. And we was able to tell a story for each one of the songs through that artwork. But what they did, it took that artist and put him into the art world, right? His artwork became collector, collector's items, right? People were blowing up the, the artwork covers and saving them. And then they was taking them to Gianni Lee when they would see him on the street to sign. So it just creates another moment for you to be able to engage with your audience in a creative way. And that's like, I think that there's aspiring artists, like independent artists, but then there's also in the visual arts world, there's the same visual artists that are really dope. Like that's the next George, right? The next Gianni Lee that you can collaborate that's right in your own neighborhood. So it gives an opportunity for you to really collaborate and then also rise together with the people that surround you. Yeah, and I also feel like that that helps tell a story. So, you know, when you want to go to to press as well, right? That kind of gives you an extra leg up versus, you know, everybody else who might be pitching to a complex or, you know, whatever, whatever other outlet. Um, yeah. You have this this really kind of unique angle within that. So I think that's that's really, really interesting. Um, you know, kind of moving to the, the same idea behind changing song titles. I mean, should artists really consider changing their song titles as a promotion tactic or how can they really kind of replicate this, the same type of engagement and hype and maybe even confusion, like you mentioned earlier, um, with a small following? Yeah, I think that there's a, a couple ways that you can do that. Um, you know, like I, we see it a lot on TikTok, right? A lot of artists upload their original sound on TikTok and uh, they wait to see if it gains traction and then wow, it's blowing up. Everybody's using my song or my, my sound and now I need it to go to the, on all the streaming platforms and now you're naming it. So it's the same concept, right? And uh, at United Masters, we just partnered with TikTok so that way artists on the platform can do that, right? So you can take your original sound on TikTok. You don't have to leave the app and you can distribute your music to all the, song, all the platforms. And this gives you an opportunity to then name it, right? But it's now giving you another moment where you can engage fans, and, and use your social media to engage fans, to post your, your, like, imagine you went on your Instagram page, Instagram story, released a snippet, and you told your fans to vote on a name, right? Now you're creating an engaging moment on social that you can then um, look to create another exciting moment for your, for your fan base. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. Um, and then kind of going in the same vein, same pillar um, with remixes, right? I mean, how can artists leverage remixes into to more momentum, right? I mean, obviously, okay, the, the concept is you just get another uh, another artist who might be just as popular or more popular than you and get them on your song. But how can you kind of go a step beyond that um, to yeah. really make a moment out of the re out of the remix? Yeah, as I answer this question, uh, for everyone who's watching, uh, in the comments, put where you get your beats from. Because I think that could be a helpful way to, to kind of set up my answer to this question. Because um, a lot of times, Artists are getting their beats off of YouTube, right? They're getting their beats off of beat stars. They might know a producer who's producing the records, right? But it gives you an opportunity to be able to create new moments and new ways to create excitement for the song, right? So same, similar to what Travis did and created a remix with a known artist, collaborate with a, another producer, right? You start building a little bit of traction on the original record, create a remix with another producer who, who produces a whole new track to the, to the song, right? Then do another version with another producer. And maybe this time you get a, a independent artist who's got a little bit more fan base in a different region, right? So now you have an opportunity for you to expose your base with two artists and two different producers who are growing their fan base in different parts of the world or different, different states. So it's another way for you to be able to collaborate and tap in and 
ultimately grow your algorithm like how Travis did by tapping into future. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, so moving into to digital, uh, you know, I think I, I would really like to break down the idea of websites, right? I mean, how can an artist really make a website kind of the one of the, the most powerful parts of a rollout? I think it's, uh, you know, kind of understanding how important are, are websites these days? Are people really going to them? Should you really have one? Should you just focus on socials? Yep. Kind of break that down for us. Yeah, I'm, I mean, ultimately, it's the point that I made with Travis again. The reason why he, he used his website, because he was now able to build his database over there, right? That's the data that you can get from your fans is the most powerful thing that big brands will pay for that, right? But more than anything, it helps you understand who your audience is, right? It's not like you have to sell your selling CDs outside of your trunk or you're sell, sending your CDs to different stores and you don't know who's engaging with your music. Now you can actually see the data. You can see the age. You can see the cities from all the different streaming platforms. But you want to now start being able to take your fans off the streaming platform and be able to monetize them in other ways, right? So when you drop that merch, you want to be able to take the emails that you got from your website and send them an email to say that you just dropped merch. You're going on tour, you want to be able to carve off your email list and say, I'm coming to your city because you know where they live, right? Because you pull that data from your email list. So you always want to be able to create uh, ways that you can drive traffic to a property that you earn, you own, right? And that's what your website is. It gives you an opportunity to own your audience and then you can engage with them in different ways. And in order to keep them engaged, you gotta keep dropping snackable content. So an idea is upload different snackable content every week, right? Change out the, the header image on your website, upload a new video clip, right? That you're always driving traffic to. So that's the only place that you see it. Or maybe it's just the first place that you see it. Right. You want to redirect people to properties that you own so that way you can collect their their information and then you can use it to be able to market your campaign later on down the line. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of content, I think this is uh, this is actually going to be kind of one of my, my favorite uh, questions to ask. Obviously, not everybody is going to be able to do the, the million dollar visuals or, or even be able to create something um, as conceptual, you know, um, or on a conceptual level like Travis does, but where can artists go to get assets like a lyric video or visualizer made for, you know, under a thousand dollars, under $500? Like what are those resources? Where should they be tapping in? Yeah, there's, there's a ton of websites out there that I use today, right? Because a lot of artists that we, we have might not have the big budget, right? And even when I, when I was working at a major label, I had artists that had budgets, but I would go to platforms like Fiverr, right? You can literally find a logo to a graphic designer to anything, right? You can get a voiceover. You can find a video editor. I've also used Upwork, right? That's a, a site where you can go and you can make bids on or you, you put basically what you're looking for. And then uh, creators will come and make bids on your job, right? And say, I'll do it for 25. And then you have another person who's coming and saying, I'll do it for 15, right? And it's a great way for you to be able to create great content and it's really dope creators. Um, and then another platform that we even use at, at uh, United Masters for a lot of our like short form content or just uh, like visuals, graphic visuals is Canva, right? They have all these templates. Uh, it costs you little to nothing. Sometimes you might have to pay for a picture for a couple of dollars, but you can create your artwork there. You can create your animated visuals there. You can create your visualizers on there. And it's just an opportunity for you to be able to uh, be res resourceful. You don't have to go and get the $1,000 uh, animated cover, right? You can animate your cover with platforms or Canva or Upwork with creators that are hungry and just, they just want to be able to show off their work. Right. So, okay. So, boom. So, I have I, I have my visuals made. Now, I'm going to, you know, put them on, on socials. Um, how should artists be uh, I guess, approaching their, their social media presence, right? I mean, different captions on each platform, developing different content on each platform. I mean, kind of what's your, what, what are your best practices for that? Yeah, you can't blast your content out just as is across all platforms. You have to start looking at uh, optimizing your content for all your different social platforms. So if you are on uh, Twitter, right, 
obviously you can't post the same kind of content you would post on Instagram, right? It's not going to be received the same way, right? Um, and you want to be able to optimize and give different versions of the content for each one of the platforms. So you should, like, it's almost like you create bespoke content for each platform, right? Um, but then I'm always with the philosophy that less is more sometimes. So uh, sometimes I won't start with, like, old school uh we used to put like releases like in seven days, my project is dropping, right? Because we needed to create the excitement, right? There wasn't as many digital outlets to be able to get the awareness out. You don't have to do that anymore. You literally can just wait three three days before your, your release, drop a pre-save on your social, drive for swipe ups and engage. But what you're doing is you're keeping the, the gap that you wanna control attention for really short, right? So that way, the fans can then get straight to the content that you want them to consume and then enjoy it and then share it and spread it to the world, right? Like I just had a conversation with an artist who put out like my project is dropping 12 days away, right? And by the seventh day, he lost momentum and steam. So you always wanna find ways that you can create content, keep uh, less is more from my perspective and find ways to just keep momentum going by refreshing your content on social. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and, and kind of moving into the, the last section, right. Um, as far as, you know, brands, um, again, not everybody can collaborate with an IMAX or a McDonald's or, you know, an Apple music, but what are some innovative ways that artists can use to, to utilize their fan base to, to kick off their rollout? Very similar to the way that, you know, Travis used Apple music and wave radio, what are maybe some, uh, you know, some some smaller, uh, I guess, kind of types of ideas that, that artists can start to implement? Yeah, I think uh, there's tons of ways. One off the top of my head, you might not have the big Apple radio station or like wave radio, but you can create your own podcast, right? You can have a podcast that could be about a totally different subject that's outside of music, but you can build your audience there. And now you have a way to be able to, to a platform to tease your music, right? You can have a conversation about anything nowadays, right? Um, but then two, uh, you can use platforms like SoundCloud to, to kind of replicate that same idea that Travis teased his song on his radio show, right? One of the things we did with 3X Bravo, one of the artists on our platform, we put his song the night before it came out on SoundCloud, right? At about 7 p.m., we dropped it as a, a teaser and we had all his fans communicate with him in his comments, right? So Bravo was responding to his fans in the comments of his song on SoundCloud. And by the time the song came out on all the other DSPs, he already had close to 20,000 streams on that song and about uh, a thousand comments on that particular song, right? So it's a way that you can create excitement um, and tease out your records on other platforms. You don't have to necessarily have to have the big platform, right? It costs you little to nothing, right? right? And then Baseline, uh, at United Masters, we have a playlist called Baseline that drops on Wednesdays. So you don't have to necessarily compete with the Friday releases and the noise from all the major labels or all the artists thinking they have to release on Fridays. Drop your, your record off cycle, right? This is a way that you can engage with a platform like Apple Music and the NBA and potentially submit your song to be added to the playlist, right? So now you have your own day of the week that you can engage your fans leading into the Friday when everyone else is talking about dropping their content. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, and, you know, kind of my last couple of questions, um, obviously working with McDonald's grand moment, right? I think everybody kind of looked at Travis is like, okay, wow, that was, that was huge. How can you turn your release into a grand moment? Again, it might not be a McDonald's, but, you know, what What can you do um, as an independent artist to kind of create a similar moment, a similar feeling of, of grandness? Yeah, I mean, what, what you're doing is you, you're trying to create some com a creative conversation, right? And it becomes a conversation piece. That's what the McDonald's thing was. Did you see that Travis has his own meal at McDonald's? Did you see that Travis dropped merch, right? And he created this frenzy by just creating a conversation piece, right? And you could do the same thing as an independent artist, right? Everyone knows of the food truck spot, right? A lot of cities have food truck parks. Go to one of the food trucks and see if they'll allow you to pair some merch or drop uh, 
uh, a campaign along with your song, right? You can build an audience based off of things that are right in front of you. And I think a lot of times we we try to uh, go for the big moments. And if we can't get those big moments, then we, we don't look at it as a, a success. But as an independent artist, it's about the journey that you're, you're consistently building all these different things. You're building momentum. You're stacking these, these different chips until you have a tipping point moment. So going to a local food spot, going to the local breakfast spot and dropping a, doing a, a asking them to, to name a song after you or a, name a, a dish after you, right? For a limited period of time. These are creative ways that you can kind of replicate the same idea of what Travis did to create a conversation piece. And it's, it's literally right in your backyard. I know that everyone probably knows someone who has a restaurant or someone who is has a food truck. Right, right, right. I love that. I love that. Okay. Um, and, you know, the, the IMAX equivalent, right? Um, not everybody can rent out a theater to do that. But, uh, you know, what are some, you know, similar ideas that artists can do to really immerse their core fan base, um, core group of key, core group of, of fans, um, once their song is released. Yeah. Um, again, it's it's like how do you create that emotional connection, right? When we talked about what Travis did with the uh, IMAX, it was about creating a immersive experience that people was gonna remember forever, right? When he did Astro World, that's exactly what people did, right? He created Astro World that people talked about, and you created an emotional connection. So like, I love what, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, the parking lot concert. Like as soon as COVID hit, the guys down in Atlanta, they started doing these parking lot concerts where people was driving up and they was literally doing shows on the top of a, a long flatbed truck, right? And it started to create, create momentum, right? It was a new way for people to consume your music or to engage with you, right? And it became a, a, a conversation piece. But ultimately, it now becomes the moment that in a time of COVID, you can pull up to a spot in your car and engage with your favorite artists or local artists in the case of, of parking lot concert. But on a small scale, like you can YouTube, you can utilize platforms like YouTube, right? Uh, utilize the premiere function on YouTube to say, to drive your fans to create excitement that, hey, Friday at 7 p.m., um, dropping my new single, uh, my new video, right? But join us at 6.45, we're gonna go live and I'm gonna give you a behind the scenes experience, right? And you can have a, a super curated uh, room where you have engagement and driving traction. So that way when eight o'clock hits, now everybody's there already in the room on YouTube to create engagement, right? Engage in the comments. So you can create these same kind of like emotional connection moments, but you can do them just being by being resourceful. And, and that's the biggest piece about being an independent artist. Along your whole way, you have to be resourceful, use relationships, favors, like, and those are the things that will essentially set you up for that moment when the masses hear your music or your song goes viral on TikTok or you drop your EP and it gets picked up by pigeons and planes, right? You got to be prepared for that moment when that happens. So in the moment when you feel like, oh, people are not paying attention to me, you want to still be building your fan base. You want to start growing that fan base from 10 fans to 20 to 100 to 1,000. And that base is what's going to help you build a sustainable career. And you can do that for little to no money. Right, right. Uh, well, David, I mean, I think this was great. Uh, you know, this really kind of um, wraps everything up as far as breaking everything down that Travis did and then I think implementing it into, um, you know, an in independent artist approach. Um, you know, I think now we can probably get into some Q&A, uh, you know, from the audience. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I think this was great. If there's anything else, you know, obviously that you want to add, please feel free. But I think now um, to, to be able to kind of answer some one on one questions would be great. Yeah, let's let's jump into some questions. But I think like ultimately, like as an independent artist, I can't keep like emphasizing enough. Like you have to be resourceful. Right. And you got to get creative. Right. So. If you don't have the money to, for a producer, like find ways to cut them into your the upside of the deal, right? Uh, videographer, like find the young videographer who's really dope that you can turn him into the hygiene, 
when you pop off, right? Or the Cole Bennett when you pop off, right? So you want to be able to find new young talent. Don't necessarily go after who's already popping. Build with the people that's around you and then grow your base, right? And grow your, your movement from there. But definitely, let's get into some uh, questions. Absolutely. I think, uh, Gil, do you see any questions that we can jump into? Cool. So what's the ideal amount of time to promote and put money on campaigns for your album visuals before they actually drop the album? Amount of time to promote. Um, well, so like we did a webinar at the beginning of the summer that basically told talked about like building the rollout, right? And Typically, if you if it's an album project, I like to start planning at least three months out, right? Because in this time, you're starting to put together the songs that's going to be on your project. You're starting to think about, like, what are you naming your project? And you're really starting to get the pieces you're ideating, right? And this is a great opportunity for you to be able to create your narrative, right, for your project, right? Because your narrative is then is going to seep into the marketing drivers that you create that's going to happen in mark month two, right? So two months before the project, your album project is dropping or your EP, whatever, you're now ideating and you're starting to create the content for your project, right? Month one, you're just kind of like buttoning up the last little few things, right? You're going out and if you have a budget that you're going to spend on influencers, you're now starting to say, this is how much I'm going to allocate to these four influencers and the rest of it is going to go towards uh, some independent playlist or some influencers do reaction videos to my music video, right? But as far as the how much money you should put in, it's case by case, right? Like in certain artists, like I always look at like what am I trying to, the, the key things that I'm trying to accomplish, right? If I'm trying to create some excitement, right? But I'm just starting out, then maybe I might take $500 and test it somewhere. Maybe I'm testing it on uh, a post on our generation music, right? And I'm trying to see if I, I, I'm building some traction or if I got some feedback from it, right? I don't just dump money into something because that's what they say the cost is. I'll test it and then measure the growth. And then after I see things respond, then I'll spend more money on it. So you can do that same idea with $5,000 budget, with $500 budget, right? You start organizing where you want to spend the funds because obviously you need content right so how much is the content going to cost you can find a videographer that's that's little to nothing or that does it for free just for the exposure or you can find a videographer that might be a little bit more polished right but you could scale your campaign from from high to low or low to high dope Okay. Uh, let's see. How do you get listeners to actually leave social platforms? Uh, that's a good question, right? So part of uh, trying to get uh, a listener to go to your, your website or to go to another platform is you got to have some sort of hook, right? And like the hook might be a piece of content, right? It might be uh, an announcement that you're going to make an announcement, but you're going to do it from this page. It could be I'm dropping my video, my music video. Yes, it's it's live on YouTube, but instead of promoting YouTube's link, you're promoting your website link, right? And it's just using different tactics and different uh, like hooks that are going to get people to go where you need them to go, right? Like everybody's going crazy over the PS5, right? So they're gonna give you the hook that it's only available at these times of the day, right? That's the hook to go to Walmart's website. So you're checking Walmart's website at three o'clock, five o'clock and seven o'clock for that restock. So you gotta think about your campaign the same same way. And no matter if you're a big artist or if you're a small artist getting started out, you gotta to try to figure out a way to create a hook that's gonna get people to go where you, you're trying to go. That's a good question, really good question. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. How important do you feel TikTok is for marketing your music at this time? 
I think it's it's really important, right? But it's not the end all be all. You know, I think all these different platforms, you have to use all of them in different ways, right? TikTok is a platform where you know the audience is really young, right? And what started off as a platform that was like lip syncing and just dance challenges is now starting to have a lot more content. You can go on TikTok and learn educational content on there, right? So you got to look at it as a way where if you're going to to do the play the TikTok game, you have to do it in a way that's authentic to your campaign, right? So if you have a, a song that's real serious, you're not going to go get Charlie D'Amelio to do a dance to your real serious song and try to create a dance challenge, right? You want to be able to create something on the platform that's going to create a conversation on the platform, right? But still fits in the style, right? But you can't be limited to just TikTok. You also have to then go to drive people to your Spotify, drive people to your Apple Music, right? Drive people to your SoundCloud, build your website, right? And all these things work together. You can't just rely on TikTok, but it is a big piece, right? Just like everything else is. Right. What is included in the ideal EPK for an EP you're projecting to release? Cool. So I don't necessarily call them EPKs. I, I usually call them marketing briefs, right? And in our marketing brief, we always start with our narrative, right? What is the narrative? Like who who is the artist? What does that artist stand for? And why should I listen to this project, right? It's basically the story. You start there. Then start thinking about the marketing drivers, right? These are things that are going to uh, get people engaged, right? That could be your video. It could be a live show. It could be uh, a, a social activation. It could be um, it could be your website, right? And then for all those drivers, I create tactics. Like, how am I going to get the word out about those drivers, or how am I going to get people to engage with those drivers? The video. All right, cool. So I'm gonna get World Star to the tactic is I'm gonna get World Star to post um, my video, or I'm going to get uh, create a a video game on my website. Like literally for one of our projects, Enelly Chapa, we created a video game for a thousand dollars, and we put it on his website. And every time you played the video game, which was it was like a hot shot basketball game, every time you played it, you were streaming his song on Spotify. So like like we outline those things in the EPK. So that way, one, for your team, you understand what the vision is, what the plan is. But then two, when you're sending out to partners, like finding that food truck that's going to partner with you or engage with you, you're sending them your your marketing brief to show them like, yo, I'm, I really thought about this. This is how I'm marketing my, my project. And these are the things I'm going to do to make it successful, right? And uh, that's what we usually do in the marketing brief. And we do that for a lot of our artists on, on platform that uh, are um, that have built momentum and just need a little bit more to get over the edge. Yeah. Uh, can you explain how content? Uh, can you explain how content would be different for Twitter and Instagram and Facebook? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, on I'll start on Twitter. So on Twitter, a big thing on Twitter is Threads, right? So you can create a conversation on Twitter, right? And you literally can create a scavenger hunt with your threads, right? You can put GIFs, you can put pictures, you can interweave your video snippets, like look at how the, the platform is used and then optimize your content for that platform, right? For Instagram, right? You have Instagram stories, you have Instagram reels, you have feed, right? So if you look at the United Masters platform, uh, Instagram page, it's a perfect example of that, right? So the feed is like our magazine, right? We give you educational content, we give you some promotional content, but we don't make it all promotional, right? We we give you content that's gonna keep you coming back to engage. The Instagram story is how we direct you. It's like our traffic cop, right? It's content that we reshare from other platforms or we wanna direct you to a link, right? Because we can swipe up. Or it's just engaging short clips that we want you to catch, capture right away. Reels is it's, it's a hybrid of like uh, showcasing artist talent or 
some maybe some funny content, right? So I think one reel that we just started we posted was the PS PS5 meme, right? So each platform, you should look at how the best way uh, to use their tools and optimize it for that way. Like on stories on Instagram, you can use, you can do polls, you can do uh, animated giphies, you can do a lot of different things on on Instagram story to engage your fan and go live on Instagram as well. We almost forgot about that. We go live every Tuesday on Instagram live. Absolutely. Do you see TikTok and Spotify, Apple Music playlist as the new radio? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think radio still has its space, right? Um, but there's just more spaces now because digital and social is is a big deal, right? Um, and each one of these platforms have their own different audience, right? TikTok is completely free, right? It's a lot younger audience there. Um, so that's like the radio for the young, what, 25 and under, right? That's where they're finding out their trends. Spotify is highly curated, it's playlist, right? But you don't have to have a subscription to listen, right? So for that audience that might not have the disposable income, they can go on Spotify and listen to your music for free, right? With some ads, of course, but it's curated. So like you have playlisters who are telling you what you should listen to. And then Apple Music is a little bit more premium, right? Because you have to pay subscription to be able to listen to the platform. But all these platforms are the radio, including radio. Right, right. Any quick advice, best practices for pitching to blogs and playlist curators? Yeah, so um, early on in, in my career, uh, one of the ways that I found bloggers was through Twitter, right? So I, I figured out that bloggers would always tweet out their articles after they wrote them. And what I would do is I would go into blogs and figure out what the name of the person was and then do a Google search and then search them on Twitter and then search for them on Instagram on Facebook. And then I would try to send them a note, try to find an email, right? And try to make it organic, build the organic relationship with them, but then also look to see who they're following, right? Because bloggers, playlist curators are people too, right? So they consume music or they have fans, they're fans of, different things, right? And they're influenced by certain things as well. So if you know that the Apple Music Curator follows these influencers, then maybe you should try to get your music and content to one of those influencers, right? So that way they discover your music from one of the influencer pages. So it's always, like I always approached uh, music marketing as being like the hacker of the whole campaign, right? You have to find a way to get to your end result, your outcome, and do it in a creative way that's gonna get people talking and create a moment where people remember you. So think about your marketing strategy and how you can get to the blogs and to the playlist curators. It's like, how am I gonna hack the process? Okay. Uh, with COVID still being very prevalent and touring and shows being limited, uh, what are your recommendations for including live performances in your rollout? Yeah, I, I think that there's, uh, you know, COVID hit us, like, I don't think anybody expected what, what COVID was going to do, right? And, but it also showed us that resourcefulness was a way that you can still reach your fans. Like, you see artists doing live stream shows, right? And I don't think that anyone would have engaged with a live stream show as much as they do now, right? Like, when you look at what Billie Eilish just did, she had a fully immersive live stream show, right? Genius is doing the same thing. Genius has, they just did it with Kid Leroy and earlier they, the summer they did it with uh, Wiz Khalifa, where literally fans from at home can pay to get on screen with the artist who's performing, right? And then make a request. So I think what COVID has done has, has given us an opportunity to be able to be creative and solve problems and or create solutions to the problem of us all having to be at home, right? And parking lot concert is another great example. It's like, we're tired of being inside the house, but we're gonna do a drive up concert. So just about being creative. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think we got a few more, uh, let's see, should, should you put more focus on one or two songs or put the focus into the project as a whole? 
Uh, usually on a project, depending on how many songs it is, I do find focus tracks, right? So if I got an EP um, that has six songs on it, I'm going to identify two to three focus tracks, right? One of them might be the teaser record where I know it's just to kind of get people excited. But then I'm pitching to DSPs or pitching to blogs, one or two focus tracks. And I'm going to choose one of them that might come out the week before. And then one that might come out the day of the project as an excitement to create excitement for the project again. And then maybe have a video that comes shortly after the, the release of the project. So like you might shoot visuals for all the songs or you might shoot the visuals for just the two focus tracks. But typically I like to, to give people uh, or the blogs or the curators two focus songs. Cause like I, some, sometimes they're going to playlist the songs that they want to playlist or the ones that they gravitate towards, but you want to give them direction. Right. And, and you want to guide them to the ones that you're putting your investment and your time and energy into. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, a couple more. Where else besides social media can you market your music? Oh man, there's, there's tons of ways. Like uh, there's a new app called community, right? Where it gives you a phone number. Um, that you can now build your audience through phone numbers. There's a new app called Clubhouse where people are talking music talk, right? Uh, there's Discord. Well, Discord is kind of like social media, right? But uh, it's not traditional social media. It's, it gives you these different, it's a server where you have different chat rooms. We launched a Discord server uh, where we actually gonna do like the marketing reviews uh, after this app. Um, then you can do the traditional uh, way of doing like out of home, right? You can do posters, flyers. Um, uh, then you can look at emails, right? You can build your email list and then you can send out email lists. Um, you can collaborate with other people in different spaces and ask to use their email list, pay to use their email list, or just collaborate with them on a project. So that way they're doing, uh, sharing your content as well. Um, but I also think like now is an opportunity for you as artists to also highlight some of the other things that you guys like to do, right? So there's an artist on our platform, she's also a beauty blogger, right? So she's creating beauty tips and routines, but she's also putting her music in it, right? And this is a way that these hundreds of thousands of people who are watching her, her beauty tips are also hearing her music. And that's a way to be able to market your music and expose it as well. Perfect, perfect. Uh, let's see. Last question. Uh, what do you suggest other than selling merchandise to generate money in relationship to your brand? That's a good question. Oh, man, that's a really good question. Obviously, merch could be a lot of different things. Um, but I also see a world where artists will start as they start growing their fan base, they'll start monetizing their music in different ways. Right. Or they might start monetizing their live streams in creative ways. So literally you can because the money that you make from the streaming is minuscule minuscule to the amount of money that you can make from all the other opportunities right the music you use it as a catalyst to be able to to uh to gain influence so that way you can then use that influence to take you into the other areas right and other business opportunities so when you launch your brand and you start building it could be your five thousand fans you should start thinking about like how, what are the things that my fans also like and how can I monetize them, right? Or how can I create things that add value to those people that they want it, right? Then you also have your set of like products or just things that you might try to create that create impulse kind of things, right? Impulse, make impulse decisions. Uh, you can create some sort of subscription service to your content, right? Or do uh, live stream, like one-on-one -on -one producer sessions and then sell that track immediately, right? Like, so there's different ways that you can just, it's just by getting creative and being resourceful. I think that there's no right answer to that. Like you can always think of being creative. And I think that artists are starting to do that. Like you, you start seeing bikers, you start seeing race car drivers, you start seeing athletes all using music as an as a opportunity to express themselves and they're monetizing all other areas around themselves to make money. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, 
David, I think this was great, man. I think this was a, a, a really great conversation. I think this was well-rounded. Um, you know, I think if, are, are there any quick takeaways, um, you know, kind of at the end of this that you, you want to give out before, uh, before we wrap up? Yeah, no, I think that uh, as an independent artist, you have a huge opportunity to uh, retain ownership, which is powerful, right? And we see it all the time where uh, these artists who have catalog are selling their, their catalog for uh, millions of dollars to these finance companies, right? So it tells you that your, your copyrights, your, your music, your publishing, your masters have value, right? And ultimately, this is something that you can pass on to your to your kids, your family, and create like. And a whole nother note is that you can build a sustainable career and be what like I like to call the middle class artist, right? You can make two hundred thousand dollars a year and live a, a successful life from streaming and dropping three four projects a year, right? So you can build these build your career gradual. Don't think that you have to rush through it. And if you're not Travis Scott level, doesn't mean that you're not successful at your career. You can take Russ, for example. Russ is highly successful and he's taking a different route and he's releasing music when he wants to and he owns his masters. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. Well, David, again, thank you, you know, so much for your time. Um, you know, for everybody who's tuning in, please, you know, feel free to head over to Discord. We're gonna be, uh, you know, reviewing um, some marketing plans. So this isn't over, um, you know, we would love to see you guys kind of head over there. Um, but I think for for this part of the webinar, I think we're uh, we're about to wrap up. So again, David, thank you so much for your time. Um, and and UM Lab, this was, uh, this was a great session. Dope. Thanks everybody. Awesome.